Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm back. Welcome back to a lovely jaunt where we read better, not more. So that's actually my tagline on all of my social media and I realized I never use it in my videos and I totally should. So first of all, some housekeeping. If you wanna jump straight into the mythic context of the Iliad, go to this timestamp that I will put somewhere on screen. Wow, you guys, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for being patient with me while I was going through some life transitions. As you can see from the background, we're now in a new location. Uh, my husband and I bought and moved into a new house since my last video, and um, that was is a huge blessing, but is always a bit of a stressful and busy time. So thank you so much. On top of that, even though I went months, months without uploading new videos, you guys have grown my channel. Thank you. Each week I saw new subscribers come in, new comments on my videos, growing views. In every way my channel has been growing and you have blown me away. I am so, so grateful for all the new members to our new community, so welcome. Okay, so enough about the channel, let's get into this topic. Today we are kicking off another literary analysis series about the Iliad. As you may remember, I started, I intended to read sort of like the canon and the classic works of all time and got into the Iliad a little bit, but then dropped off because I never finished reading the book. Well, I've like had this renewed passion and this renewed joy in reading and I I just sped through this book and I'm so excited to actually finish this video series and continue this series on, on the canon, so it's gonna be great. The Iliad is honestly one of my favorite books. It is awesome and I love it and you should too. This video and two more that are upcoming are designed to give you the contextual knowledge you need to understand the Iliad. And as you can see, I'm working from Richmond Lattimore's translation, an excellent translation that it pres preserves the poetry of the Iliad. Another great translation is Roger Fagel's. If you get a good translation, you're gonna have a much better experience and it's gonna be a lot easier for you to understand uh, what the Iliad is saying. <laughs> so get a good translation, spend the money, it's worth it. After we get through these introductory materials, so these three introductory videos, we're gonna have four more that are going to be actually analyzing the text like I do for all my other books. And as always, these are gonna be full of spoilers and they're designed to be an in-depth look at the text. One last note, trigger warnings. Greek stories and Greek mythology is full of really horrible violence, lots of sexual assault, rape, general misogyny. So if you are sensitive to that type of content, I would give this book and a lot from the classical world a pass, as well as this video series as I will be talking about that type of content. Okay, so let's jump into the mythic context of the Iliad. So an important note here before I dive into these stories is that the Greeks viewed these as pretty much historical. They believed that Achilles and all the heroes really did fight in the Trojan War and that these events really did come to pass. So while I'm referring to it as the mythic context or the mythic stories surrounding the Iliad, they would have considered it history. The Greek audience of Homer um, and thereafter appeared to have sort of a general knowledge and be in agreement about the major plot points of the cycle of stories that include the Iliad, but also go well beyond it. So what we have in the Iliad is one episode in the 10th year of the Trojan War. It's really the tragedy of Achilles, and we don't even get the end of the Trojan War in this story that is outside of the context of this story. So it's really important to understand that it's just considered one small piece of what was going on. There was also a whole body of work written after Homer that was seemingly drawn from these shared stories. So we get plays about the lead up to the war. We get plays from the perspective of Trojan women and their fate. We get the return of the Greek heroes, not just Odysseus, but many of the other Greek heroes are given their own stories and episodes, um, and it seems that the majority of this overarching story was known for by Greek audiences. Oh, and then of course we get the Aeneid, which was written by the Romans much later, sort of drawing on that same tradition and building their own tradition of a founding story. So let's dive into it um, so that you can have the same context that Homer assumed his audience had when he was performing it. There was a prophecy about the goddess Thetis, she's a sea nymph, and the prophecy was that her son would be superior to and more powerful than her father. 
as a result, not a lot of guys wanted to marry her. Not a lot of gods wanted to marry her. We have famously Zeus overthrowing his father Kronos to become the king of the gods. And so this idea of the son being more powerful than this other god father was a big turnoff. So none of them wanted to marry her. Instead, it was decided that she would wed a mortal. So yeah, she would have a son who was super powerful for a mortal, but at least he would be a mortal and not a god. And so she was given to Peleus, a king in Greece. A divine wedding was held and everyone was invited except for Eris, the goddess of discord, because I've gotten married. No one wants discord at their wedding. Nonetheless, she showed up, as she tends to do at these types of events, with a golden apple that was inscribed to the fairest. She tossed it among the goddesses, and Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite all reached for it, assuming, well, obviously it's meant for me. I'm the fairest one. Paris, a prince of Troy, was selected to arbitrate this debate. You notice that Zeus stays out of it. His wife is among the three ladies, so if he doesn't pick her, that's going to be a problem. So he's like, pick somebody else to make this decision. Each goddess offered her own prize if selected. Hera offered the rule of Asia, Athena offered skill and wisdom in war, and Aphrodite offered the most beautiful woman in the world. Paris, being an idiot and full of lust, selected Aphrodite, but it turned out that the most beautiful woman in the world was already married to Menelaus, another Greek king. Now Helen has her own interesting origin story. She and her twin sister Clytemestra were conceived when Zeus raped their mother, Leda, in the form of a swan. So that's a pretty famous myth. If you haven't read it, it's... All of these myths about Zeus raping women, like in the form of another thing, so richly symbolic, but also about rape, so maybe not the most uplifting stories. Because of Helen's enviable beauty, all of the suitors who came out to court her swore an oath that if she were ever stolen away, they would all band together against that one person who stole her. So it's a little bit of foresight into the idea that she's such a desirable woman that she's gonna be that, that there's a potential for something like this to happen. So when Aphrodite encourages and arranges for this new love relationship between Paris and Helen, and Helen seemingly going completely of her own free will and accord with Paris, the Greeks obviously gathered for war, but there was a problem. The winds were bad. Soon enough, Agamemnon, the leader of these groups of, king, of, groups of Greeks, um, seeks the counsel of their seer, Calchas, and he determines that Aulus, opposed to the Greeks and demands a sacrifice. Only Agamemnon's own daughter will do. So Agamemnon arranges for his daughter to be married to the one and only Achilles, but it's a trick. As she is being led down the aisle, he sacrifices her himself, stabbing her to death. So even though the Greeks pr practiced animal and food sacrifices to the gods, human sacrifice would have been appalling. And this idea of a father killing this, any kind of matricide or patricide or children being killed, this murder within the family is something that's really common to Greek stories and Greek tragedies. They found this particularly appalling, as they should. But the sacrifice worked. Aulus changed the wind and the Greeks were able to sail to Troy. Now you'll notice that I didn't bring up the whole dipping of Achilles in the river Styx. As you may know, this story goes that, um, you know, Styx is the barrier between the living world and the underworld. And the idea in this story is that Thetis, wanting to protect her son, dipped him into the river Styx to make him invulnerable to wounds. He was unable to be pierced by a weapon, except for at the heel where she held him when he dipped when she dipped him. And so this may be tied into the idea of a prophecy that does exist in the Iliad that if Achilles goes to the Trojan War and fights, he will die there. But if he refuses to participate in the Trojan War, that he will live to old age as a peaceful and agrarian king for and have a long, peaceful and good life. And so part of what the Iliad is dealing with is like, which of these alternatives is better? Is it better to have honor and war and be remembered forever or to have a peaceful life and live a long life? So the reason why I didn't include that in the mythic context is actually because Homer makes no reference to this at all in the Iliad. There's no sense 
that Achilles is unable to be wounded except for at the heel. So many agree that this story must have been developed after the Iliad was composed. One thing that I find really interesting is that this single point of invulnerability shows up in a lot of different myths. It's really common for epic heroes to have this. I think we've talked about this before. Sigmund slash Siegfried also has a single point of invulnerability. In his story, he had a linden leaf got stuck in the middle of his back right between his like shoulder blades. After he killed a dragon, the dragon's blood poured all over him, making his skin invulnerable to any kind of wound, except for that one place where the linden leaf was stuck between his back. Likewise, Samson from the Bible, he's given extraordinary strength unless his hair is cut, so that's kind of a similar idea. And even Harry Potter has a particular vulnerability at his scar, sort of rep it's representative of that mental connection between Lord Voldemort and Harry Potter, which we see in the later books. A defining scar or mark, like the linden leaf was supposed to be visible on Sigmund, or the scar on Harry Potter, is quite common among epic heroes as well. Usually this is associated with that point of vulnerability. So we have Frodo who loses a finger by the time he's done with his epic cycle, and Odin who loses his eye as a sacrifice to wisdom. Anyway, I love the way that mythology sort of overlaps and we see these reduplicating of these concepts over and over again. I find it really, really interesting. So that is the mythical context leading up to the Trojan War. I'm going to leave off here and we'll pick it up again when we take a look at the beginning of the actual story. The next video is actually going to be about the historical roots of the war. Was there an actual Trojan War? I'm also going to tie in some of the earliest attempts at archaeology because even this history of archaeology ties in with the Trojan War and it makes it for a very interesting study. And then finally we're going to examine Homer as a historical figure himself. Who was he um, and, and who was he? That's all I've got on that topic. Until next time, I'm Alexandra and I'm still a bibliophile.